Hello everyone, welcome back. I am pretty excited about this video because I'm going back to my roots talking about networking and IP addresses. So let's get right into it. If you follow me on Twitter, you probably see or saw my post about a graphic that I found on my Instagram Explore page about hackers being able to track you by your IP address. Uh, I would like to first say there's really not much of anything in this graphic that is correct. But I thought this would be a good opportunity to talk about IP addresses. What are they? Where do they come from? And can hackers use them to find you or track your location? Now, everyone wants to know, can hackers track your IP address and find you? Um, no. Uh, in the vast, vast majority of 99.9% .9 of cases, that would be no. Uh, so let's talk about why that is. So IP addresses, specifically in this video, we're talking about IPv4, but this is also true for IPv6, are managed by a global authority. This is the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. They're the, the ones who allocate IP addresses and, you know, write up these rules about how to use them because basically everybody in the world, if they want to be on the internet and interconnected with everybody else, needs to follow this authority, right? So let's talk about the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority because this was officially established in 1988, uh, but it had been unofficially established and around and tracking these things for a long time prior to its official establishment. So it was kind of around and started with ARPANET, which was a government-funded research project whose main goal was to connect uh, I think like Pentagon systems together and, and different things like that. Uh, it was kind of heavily influenced by the military because they wanted a decentralized uh, connection. So, you know, if there was a centralized connection, it could just be attacked. And with one attack, it could bring the whole thing down. So that's what they wanted was more of just like a decentralized network. And from ARPANET, it you know, a lot of people built protocols. A lot of these uh, people were, they were researchers at, you know, colleges like UCLA or Stanford. And I think there were some other college uh, colleges involved in the research uh, and creation of ARPANET. Now, ARPANET was discontinued in, or dis decommissioned in 1990, but a lot of the things that we learned from ARPANET were included and implemented in the World Wide Web and the internet that we know today. Specifically, one of the things that came out of it was TCIP, and that still runs the internet today. And because we need to organize and have uh, these protocols kind of have some type of standardization, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority was created. IPv4 has a limited number of addresses, right? So I will put like this kind of graphic up over here, a limited number of IP addresses. And I feel like in the 90s, when things were just kind of connecting between, you know, government facilities or college campuses, research institutes, they did not quite have an idea of how insane the internet would become and how it's just exploded. And I feel like maybe they are like, oh, maybe everyone will have an IP address one day. But the, the reality is most of us have tons of IP addresses or, or need tons of IP addresses. It's not just like one IP address per person. I mean, think of all of the devices that you have in your own house uh, that are connected to the internet, especially we're talking about like IOT devices. You have your cell phone, your ring doorbell, you have your Apple watch, your computers, your TVs, your coffee makers, your smart fridges. I mean, it's kind of insanity. And how do you project that like into the future it's it's a little unthinkable but 
here we are now, which is fantastic and great. And I love it. Um, but you know, when IPv4 was created, we just did not have that foresight. So there's, there's not enough IP addresses, IPv4 addresses. And so there are certain things that have been made to kind of help with that. One would be network address translation. So instead of everybody having multiple tons of different IP addresses, we, we have the difference between uh, public and private IP addresses. So think of a private IP address. These are typically things that are with IP addresses inside of a company. Like all of those computers are connected to a, or have a private IP address assigned to them. In your own home, what your devices are running off of are private IP addresses. Now, once you exit, once you leave the house, once you leave the company and you need to access things on the internet at other companies or other houses, that is when your router at home will translate that private IP address into maybe a singular public IP address. And so my house just has one IP address that's assigned to me by my internet service provider, and it changes. So it's not even always the same. I don't have my very own IP address that I'm like, oh, you can always find me at this address, right? And uh, that's, you know, we have NAT, thankfully, because that helped reduce the amount of uh, public IP addresses that needed to be used. And then we also came out with IPv6, which has a ton more addressing space, and I will save all that for a different video. Now, when we go back, right, so we're going back to the internet uh, assigned number authority, they were giving out blocks of these IP addresses to regional authorities. So there's five regional authorities um, covering different parts of the globe. Now, these regional authorities uh, would hand these out to internet service providers. Companies could request blocks of IP addresses saying, hey, like I need this many or that many. And, and then based on you know specific qualifications, they could be assigned those IP addresses. And in the early days, like I said, a lot of the internet was run off of like academic universities, you know, some, some companies who are early on into getting, uh, getting on the internet and getting IP addresses and requesting them. So some of these, they were just handing them out. They just had tons of these IP addresses that they weren't using. And, you know, I think back then they weren't as cautious with handing out these giant blocks of addresses. I mean, millions of them. And in 2011, the internet's assigned number authority ran out of addresses to hand out. And they were all handed out to the regional authorities and the authorities handed all those out to, you know, companies within their region. And that, that was kind of... I don't want to say the end of that. It wasn't the end of that, but eventually those regional authorities also ran out of these IPv4 addresses. And that's why there is a big push for IPv6 because we're going to continue to add numbers or computers and, and, and things like that and that will need these IP addresses. You know, there's an article that I had read a while back about MIT sold... 8 million of their IP addresses, unused IP addresses to Amazon. So you see these large cloud providers kind of popping up and they're like, we need public addresses. We need these addresses. So Amazon specifically, I mean, they have, I think an estimate of $2 billion worth of IP addresses. And that's like an asset. Imagine $2 billion of just IP addresses. That's crazy to think about. Um, And so there are these kind of exchanges that can happen. So, you know, how MIT had, they're like, we're not using these 8 million addresses. Like, let's make money by selling them to a company. And then there's data brokers and things like that. These brokers that will kind of take the sellers and the buyers and bring them together, potentially broker a deal. Maybe there's, uh, this is happening privately too, But these deals must be approved by the internet uh, assigned number authority or these regional authorities before they can take place. 
Now, back to the original graphic that sparked this conversation. So if you see like 192, is that based off that of your country? No, it has nothing to do with what country you're in at all whatsoever. Um, it has nothing to do with your state. These weren't assigned like that specifically. I mean, think of Google and Google has tons of different offices. So if Google had an IP address space, um, you know, they can be all over the country. It really depends. You know, some of these IP addresses can kind of be linked back to uh, a estimated geographical location uh, based off a few factors, like maybe who owns that IP address and things like that. But ultimately, hackers are not able to look at your IP address and then kind of Google, oh, like this number means this country and this means this device and things like that. It doesn't work like that. Now, could a hacker get your IP address and be like, oh, I see you're in Dallas, Texas? Then, yeah, that's possible. And then in some, you know, cases where there's maybe illegal activity going on and let's say the police need to know what, who, who had this IP address, right? They'll say this IP address was used at this time and this date and we need to know who you assigned this IP address to. And the ISP can say that address was assigned to this customer at this address. And the police could get that information that way. And like I said, it has to be time and date because IP addresses change and um, yeah. So you aren't just assigned, your, your device doesn't necessarily have its own when we are specifically talking about IPv4 addresses. Now, this leads into a bigger conversation of, you know, be careful what you see on the internet, especially from tech influencers who have, even if they have a large following, you know, sometimes they are spreading information that's not correct or not true. And be curious to do your own research. And if you have questions, let me know. Maybe I will make uh, some NAT videos in the future. I do have a video about TCP I love to talk about. So please subscribe and follow me. Comment your questions. And I hope you have a great day. Just be careful about the information you receive on the internet. Thanks, everyone. Bye.